As we saw in the last lecture, the recent history of humans is one of spreading across the planet and encountering different diets and different pathogens as they spread. They also changed for random reasons genetically. As a result, patients vary genetically in ability to resist infectious disease and in susceptibility to degenerative diseases because of this recent evolutionary history. There were observations quite a while back that suggested that people vary genetically in their susceptibility to disease. Children are at greater risk of succumbing to an infectious disease if one of their parents had it. For several diseases that include TB and bacterial meningitis, many are infected but few get sick, so some are resistant. People living in an area where a disease is endemic are often more resistant than those in a region where the disease does not exist, indicating that there's some local adaptation to disease. Now, there are a number of approaches to find genes for disease resistance. The first is the candidate gene approach, and this is the older of the two approaches. For example, a combination of biological insight, biochemistry, cell biology, was used to identify sickle cell anemia and other hemoglobin variants that confer malaria resistance. The more recent approach is uh, genome-wide association studies, GWAS. So these are based on single nucleotide polymorphisms and whole genome sequences, and they have suggested many more candidate genes, most of which have much smaller effects than those that were identified with candidate gene approaches. Some of the susceptibility genes that were discovered with candidate gene approaches are to major diseases. And let's first take a look at the diseases. So, we can see here that out of this list of six genes that have been identified, four of them relate to malaria. This is a real signal of how important a selective agent malaria has been in the recent human past. Another is for Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, that is a prion disease. Another is for HIV-1, so for the uh, virus that causes AIDS, that is a receptor called CCR5. And another is for Norwalk virus diarrhea. And by the way, it's not surprising that a gene providing resistance to diarrhea would be on one of the top lists because diarrhea is one of the major causes of infant mortality on the planet. So here we have the particular names of the genes, both their uh, acronym and the condition or the variant that is associated with these. And these were discovered between 1954 and 2003. One of the uh, genetic systems that's implicated in disease resistance is the blood, ABO blood group system. For example, people who are blood type A are more susceptible and people who are blood type O are more resistant to plasmodium falciparum that is the pathogen that causes the nastier type of malaria. People with blood type O, on the other hand, are more susceptible, and people with blood type B are more resistant to Norwalk virus. So these are both serious issues, and you can see here that there's a trade-off going on among these genetic variants. The one that's good for resisting one disease is not good for resisting another. O and A are both more susceptible to Helicobacter pylori, which adheres to gastric epithelial cells that use blood group antigens associated with O. So people with type O are going to be more susceptible to having uh, stomach ulcers and gastric cancer. That blood group is more common in isolated populations in Central and South American Indians. Susceptibility to syphilis, cholera, and plague also depend on ABO genotype. And mutations can cause reduced secretion of ABO into saliva, and those that are homozygous non-secretors are, are at higher risk of infectious disease, for example, meningitis. However, secretors are at higher risk of upper respiratory tract infections. So you can see that even within this system, just how much of it is expressed leads to a trade-off between susceptibility to meningitis or to upper respiratory tract problems. Here is an example of a GWAS result to give you some familiarity with it. What you see here on the x-axis is the DNA sequence 
along a particular chromosome. This is chromosome 18, and these are positions in kilobytes. So marching down the chromosome, if this is 18,000, that means that we are 18 million positions from the beginning of the chromosome. And the black dots and the colored dots here are the probabilities that a particular SNP is associated with the disease. So the way this is done is you have a sample of people that do or do not have the disease and do or do not have the SNP, and you march down, in doing the analysis, you go right down the chromosome looking at each position and asking how strongly is this position, position associated with the disease. On the y-axis, what we have basically is the probability. So the higher the position on the y-axis, the more significant the result is. This particular result here with the purple dot has a probability of being observed at random of about one in a billion. It's about actually a, a third of one in a billion. So this is a highly significant result. And as you go down the chromosome, you can see that many of the results are not highly significant. And then suddenly when you hit this position, which has this particular name for that SNP, you get a highly significant result. Now, the other thing that you should note are these gray lines down here with these little spikes in them. These are recombination frequencies. <coughs> what they show basically is the chunk of the chromosome which is associated with the SNP. So this area is recombining fairly frequently here this one is certainly recombining frequently, and these somewhat less. This particular SNP, therefore, is strongly associated with any gene that's in this part of the chromosome, in particular one which is called RBBP8. So it is riding through the generations and through many different people, mostly in association with this gene. So you can think of it, you can think of the SNP as a flag planted into the chromosome that marks a chunk of it which is reliably associated through recombination events and continues to be associated with it. It is passed through parents and offspring and descendants. And this is the kind of result that leads to the identification of a gene associated with particular illness by GWAS. In particular, this one is for tuberculosis and it is using mostly results from people in Africa. Using that method, here is a list of genes for disease resistance that were confirmed and then extended by GWAS. And up at the top, basically, we can see many of the ones we've seen before, but then you can see that there are quite a few others that have been added to it. And in addition, we find protection for particular variants against norovirus, against leprosy, against meningitis, against bacteremias. Interestingly, there are one, two, three, four entries here for leprosy, indicating how important leprosy has been as a selective agent in recent human history. So to summarize first on GWAS, the sequencing of the human genome made possible the development of these genome-wide association studies, GWAS. Some alleles have been identified with significant impacts on important common diseases. However, their effect sizes are often fairly small. We're not able to explain very much of the susceptibility to those diseases through genetic variation of this type. Their causal links to the diseases can be obscure. And that means that the promise of individual medicine based on information and genetic sequences is not yet really fully realized. However, the cost of sequencing a human genome is dropping remarkably. The white line here is Moore's Law. That relates to the processing power of chips. And uh, it has been dropping steadily. This is a log scale here. This is time along this axis. And what you can see is that the cost per genome was dropping about at the rate of Moore's Law up until about 2007. And since then, it's going much faster. And in fact, in 2015, one can sequence a human genome for about $1,000 to $1,500. And that is putting 
whole genome sequencing within the reach of clinical medicine for individual patients, for people who are in rich developed countries and have good insurance support. So to summarize, as humans spread across the planet and differentiated genetically, they produced populations that have different kinds and amounts of genetic variation. Genetic variation for disease resistance has been identified for malaria, leprosy, HIV, typhoid fever, Norwalk virus, prion disease, and tuberculosis. The patterns that are now observed could have been produced both by a loss of resistance in some groups and by its acquisition in others, so this can work both ways. Genetic variation for susceptibility has been identified for 11 diseases, including type 2 diabetes, biliary liver cirrhosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and pancreatic cancer. Proper treatment will often require precise determination of an individual's genomic state, and the current cost of sequencing that state is about $1,000 to $1,500, so it is getting within reach.